Black history is Indiana history. So today we celebrate the triumphs and contributions of Black Americans and how they made this country what it is today. For the next 20 minutes, join us as we take you on a journey through Indy's vibrant Black history and its contributions to the Hoosier State. And we'll start with a couple of questions. Where did the celebration of Black History Month begin? And how did it become a month in the first place? Dr. Woodson was a teacher, he was a scholar, he was a historian, and he was an individual who saw that there wasn't recognition of black history. After graduating from Harvard in 1912, Dr. Carter G. Woodson saw the lack of black history being taught and that black achievements were many times not included. In 1915, he started the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, an organization which still exists today but is known as ASALA. Dr. Woodson wanted to not only show images and share stories of African Americans that were downtrodden in the 1910s and 20s, but also the achievements and accomplishments of a race. To do this, the Journal of Negro History was created to provide knowledge and inspire progress for black people in 1916. Woodson spent the next several years publishing from his home office in D.C. and promoting that history through teaching, public lectures, and his writings. And in 1926, Woodson's first Negro History Week was held in February. He established it in February to coincide with the birthdays of President Abraham Lincoln and the scholar, the writer, the orator, Frederick Douglass. Two figures whose actions greatly impacted African Americans. Dr. Woodson's goal was always to grow beyond a week, but for the accomplishments of black people to be recognized every day of the year. These are things that have been accomplished in spite of, and these are things that we can recognize and hopefully also provide some type of inf inspiration. But it wasn't until the 1960s where calls for extending Black History Week into a month-long celebration became more prominent. College students were a big part of that influence, but Asala pushed for federal recognition. In 1976, President Gerald Ford officially established Black History Month for our nation. The past it helps us to understand what's taking place today. It helps us to understand the present, but it also helps to give us inspiration. It, it is so wonderful to learn about people who were able to accomplish so much. And you can say to yourself, wow, this person inspires me. What a great story. Since the mid 1970s, every American president, Democrat and Republican has issued proclamations highlighting Black History Month pushing our nation one step closer to recognizing black history is American history and serves as inspiration to all. We share history. So when I'm sharing black history, I'm sharing Indiana history, and I'm sharing the history of this country. Students across the country learn about Crispus Attucks, the first victim of the Boston Massacre in the lead up to the American Revolution. Crispus Attucks High School is named after him and houses this museum. His story is often the start of black history lessons. Crispus Attucks High School plays its own role in black history and not just in Indiana. In 1955, their boys basketball team became the first all black high school team in the entire country to win a state championship in any sport. It's a proud history they're bringing to life for a new generation, as Scott Swan explains. Dress rehearsals are underway inside of a historic school you can move up, you can move about a historic team. I'm very excited about what audiences are going to see. A new stage production tells the story of the 1955 Crispus Attucks boys basketball team. They became the first all-black team to win a state championship in any sport in the country. Stranger in the hole! Stranger in the hole! Actors portray the bond between the players and the challenges they faced 69 years ago. Racism, segregation, you know that they were treated as second class everywhere that they traveled. In the first 15 years of Crispus Attucks history, the team was not allowed to compete in the state basketball tournament, but the rules changed in 1942. Oscar Robertson from the corner. Then in 1955, legendary basketball player Oscar Robertson and his teammates ran the table. In that year when they were winning, they, they became the city's team. And so throughout the course of that season, 
The city was behind them. Go Christmas Islands. The Tigers culminated their historic season by beating Gary Roosevelt in the title game. But that 1955 Christmas Addicts team wasn't able to fully celebrate the way that white teams did back in the day. You see, they were denied the opportunity to participate in the victory parade around Monument Circle. There was fear that it would be a disturbance. But to be let down by your own city is really what resonated for me. And so it was like, we won, we won, we won, but it was only a touch of glory. Citywide recognition would come decades later. The Tigers were honored at a Pacers game and celebrated in a 500 festival parade. Today, the trophy and the championship banner, plus the exhibits inside the school museum are a source of pride for the kids who now attend Christmas Attics. It's just a symbol for our school um, as to what is possible and what we can do when we come together, when we work hard, um, we're able to achieve and reach that pinnacle of success. And the winning extended beyond that magical season. The 55 team was the first, but then they went on to a undefeated season and further um, demonstrated their dominance. Christmas Addicts is still winning today, athletically and academically. We just graduated 93.8% of our students this past spring and spring of 2023 with 0% waivers. And so that's something that we're really incredibly proud of. Basketball players have provided decades of inspiration at Christmas Addicts. These young men were capable of making a change, not just here at the school, but also just in the city, in the state, and they gained national notoriety. And now there's a new way to tell the story. You're gonna be on TV tonight. Sharing a touch of glory from the stage for generations to come. There was a special matinee of a touch of glory over All-Star Weekend here in Indianapolis. That same weekend, the city and the league announced they were building a statue to honor Oscar Robertson and his role in our history. The statue will be placed in front of Christmas Attics High School next year. Here's some renderings of what the statue will look like. Robertson was back in town for All-Star Celebration and spoke exclusively with WTHR about his return to the city. NBA is a great game. You know, you know kids, everything is three-point shot now, uh, that type of thing. But you still have to have defense and rebounding to win the game. And the teams that do that, they're going to win. But you got to have individual players, you know, to, to do it right. You got to have players who go one-on-one -on -one with the basketball. The state of Indiana has a love affair with the game of basketball. The Indiana State Museum houses a lot of artifacts that tracks the relationship between the game and our state. The world knows about the connection which made Indianapolis the perfect host city for the 2024 All-Star Game. The event brought back one of Indy's own, Babyface. Before he sang the national anthem at the game, he shared a different set of gifts, as Emily Longnecker shares. If you're 40 and older, chances are a Babyface song was part of the soundtrack when you fell in love or got your heart broken. But Thursday, a whole new generation joined the Kenneth Babyface Edmonds fan club. You want to learn more about Babyface? Yeah! Edmonds visited Carl White Elementary School with Music Will, the nonprofit he's partnered with, to bring musical instruments and other resources to music departments at 20 IPS schools. The music icon knows firsthand the power music can have in a child's life. It's like you become a superhero. It's like everything else, nothing else matters. And the music just gives you a power. Suddenly, you're not shy anymore. Edmonds would know a little something about that. He was just a shy sixth grader from Naptown when he first saw the Jackson 5 perform in Indy. Funny to imagine, hey, I, I want to do that. Maybe I could do that one day. Not really thinking it was possible. Two years later, when the Jacksons came back to town, he called their promoter, pretending to be his eighth grade English teacher. When I called the promoter and told him that um, I had this great idea about kids interviewing kids, which I guess it worked, um, and um, I ended up getting to meet them. Uh, my first question was, what's your favorite color? <laughs> so, not a, not a great interview. <laughs> not a problem. Edmonds knew what he wanted to do, and over the past four decades, he's done it. 
My superpower was in music. But even now, with 13 Grammys, more than 100 top 10 R&B and pop hits, not to mention a highway in his hometown named after him. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I don't believe the hype. Hype aside, Edmonds is still nervous when he thinks about singing the national anthem Sunday. I've sung, sung it a million times, but, you know, you get in front of people and you, you know, I got to uh, hope that superpower takes over. <laughs> a superpower Edmonds happily shared with these kids. The next whoever could be in that room. The next shy kid from Naptown, who music changes everything for. The All-Star Game weekend was almost as much about celebrating Black History Month as it was the game of basketball. The Madam Walker Theater here hosted a gospel celebration the Thursday before the games. That Saturday, the city hosted the All-Star HBCU Classic at Cambridge Fieldhouse a game that Dominic Miranda says was about more than sports. There's a lot going on here in Indianapolis as a part of NBA's All-Star Weekend. A big part during Black History Month is the HBCU Classic going on here at Gamebridge Fieldhouse Saturday afternoon. It's the NBA's third time hosting the event between two HBCU schools, giving them a larger platform and highlighting inclusion. Saturday night, Virginia Union University and Winston-Salem State University will square off in the HBCU Classic. Two story programs and conference rivals from the CIAA Conference sharing a stage in Indianapolis. To bring basketball there and to give that community an opportunity to see our schools and to showcase HBCUs and just see the impact that the NBA is trying to make beyond the game. Rich basketball history combined with the platform to show it off. Both schools' athletic directors agree this is something worth getting excited about. So having the NBA tap Winston-Salem State University is really an honor and a privilege, but an amazing opportunity for these young men, some who have never been in this space, and for some, this may be the only time they are in this space as well, but also for people to get a chance to know who we are. We are very excited uh, because it really gives us an opportunity to expand our brand. This again, uh, it's, it's a stage that really would allow us to tell our story to a larger audience. Sharing the story of HBCU basketball, a weekend full of experiences for HBCU fans, students, and athletes, all part of the NBA's mission in starting the HBCU Classic. A mission to inspire and connect people everywhere through the power of basketball. This brings in the global platform that we have that we're opening it up to make it more inclusive. Both schools will also each receive $100,000 from the NBA, highlighting its ongoing support and commitment of HBCUs. For 13 Sports, I'm Dominic Miranda. Black History Month is all about celebrating black culture and lifting up black voices. That's what they do here at the Madam Walker Theater Center. This building was a manufacturing plant for Madam C.J. Walker's cosmetic business, the one that made her the first self-made woman millionaire in America. But this isn't the only place where black stories are taking center stage, as Jenny Runovich reports. Inside the Phoenix Cultural Center, August Wilson's Ma Rainey, <laughs> is the first night of rehearsal for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. I'm so, so excited to have all of y'all here. But this is more than a table read of an American masterpiece. It's also part of something special happening with Indy's art scene. Yeah, you just play what I say. Performers taking from page to stage stories of black culture and black playwrights in Indy's first black equity theater. We are the Naptown African American Theater Collective. We're the first theater that is black owned, black run, and black led that is a part of the Actors' Equity Association in Indianapolis. So we don't have to run to Chicago. We don't have to run to Louisville. We don't have to go to Cincinnati. We can find it right here in our own home, in our own backyard. As an equity theater, it means indie-based actors can make a living off their craft. They get paid for their performances, have specific hours and rehearsal structures, can work to become equity union members, just like Broadway or larger regional theater. It's still a lot of fun, but it, it feels like a real job because it is a real job. And that job here also comes with a mission. The actors come from all backgrounds, but there's a commitment to showcasing stories of the black experience. Ma Rainey, which opens in March, is the third play in their inaugural season. It's about the mother of the blues, a pivotal figure in American history, and its message resonates with modern audiences too. Levy, you worse than it. You even without a prince. There's great fun, there's great joy, but there's also a lot of 
pathos. There's a lot of poignant moments uh, because it's dealing with the condition of being African-American in 1927. How much have things changed from 1927 to 2024? That's what Mr. Irvin told me. Says it right there on the list he gave you. Theater and the arts have the power to educate and empower. That's what's happening here. This company was formed to give voice to the voiceless in our city, to give opportunity to black people and people of color to do professional theater that truly speaks to the beauty, the power, and the humanity of black stories. And they plan to keep sharing those stories. NAATC is changing the landscape of the art scene in Indianapolis. One show at a time. In Indianapolis, Jenny Runovich, 13 News. One reason we have Black History Month is because historically, black stories have been excluded. Indiana has played its role in that, both as a hotspot of Klan activity in the 1950s and as a key route in the Underground Railroad, helping American slaves escape bondage. But even that could get complicated. In 1844, John Freeman came to Indianapolis. As a free black man, he bought land here at 10th and Pennsylvania. But in 1853, a Southern slaveholder claimed Freeman as a runaway. Freeman was jailed for nine weeks, but an Indianapolis lawyer successfully got that claim dismissed. It's just one stop on the Underground Railroad here in Indiana, as Julia Brooks explains. You'll still see its original name on the outside of the building, the Slippery Noodle Inn, first the Tremont House, and down in the basement. This could have been used for the hiding spots as well. Another space, preserved as it was when it helped freedom seekers on the Underground Railroad. So this is one of our other uh, underground tunnels that dumped into the basement here. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, there's still an opening there. Yeah. Sean Lothridge is a new co-owner of the inn. Is it a tiny compartment because it's collapsed or is that just the size of a lot of these tunnels at the time? I'm assuming it's because it was collapsed. I can't imagine that's the size of the tunnel when it was active. Probably wasn't much bigger than that. The Underground Railroad was actually not a series of underground tunnels. It was mostly a network of people secretly helping freedom seekers however they could. But here, these tunnels are believed to be a vessel for those fleeing further north. From what we understand, in the early 1900s, they collapsed a lot of those tunnels that connected downtown Indianapolis. So that's when we think this got collapsed in. The Slippery Noodle is in the National Register of Historic Places, but for its spot in downtown's wholesale district. A stop by Indiana Landmarks, where Calvin Wynn explains it can be hard to prove many stops on the route to freedom. And for good reason, because um, with the Underground Railroad, you didn't really want to go out advertising these things. Both then and now. But there are kind of clues to, to key you in on um, if it was a station or not. Um, one, one part is physical evidence or um, looking at its um, position within the city. So, for example, the Slippery Noodle Inn is right next to Union Station. And so, ironically, enslaved people could have fleed um, to Indianapolis or away from Indianapolis uh, via that physical railroad. And it doesn't take a historical marker to keep preserving and sharing that history. In Indianapolis, Julia Brooks, 13 News. Monument Circle honors the silent victors, those who died fighting for their country, and that includes those who died in the Civil War. Among them was the 28th Regiment of U.S. Colored Troops, black soldiers who went from Indianapolis to fight in the Siege of Petersburg and eventually occupy the Confederate capital of Richmond. 212 of them, more than half of the regiment's strength, died fighting for the Union. Since then, Indiana has grown and changed, and black Hoosiers have been there every step of the way because black history is Indiana history.